Hello everybody, my name is Magnus Holberg and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, membranes. What they are and how they can be used for producing drinking water and also treating sewage water. So let's get on with it. Membranes growing up and thriving, so how did it all start? Well, it started in the Middle East where they used to distill water which was very costly and by using membranes they could desalinate the water to a much lower cost. And in 83 a large project was started in Bahrain where the largest at that time desalination plant was built. And on the picture here to the right you can see a pre-treatment step then you see the reverse osmosis step, the heart of the desalination plant. And finally, you see the post-treatment and storage tanks for the produced drinking water. Now, today, membranes for freshwater treatment and saltwater treatment are a conventional and widely used process. Now, drinking water, how does it look on the wastewater side? Well, sewage water started in 1960s initially, and then it had also a very fast development. And looking at 1990, uh, not so many years ago, it could be considered a conventional method. The membrane bioreactors were taken into operation in, in Europe. So today, uh, you can say that membrane bioreactors uh, are used when you have a very sensitive recipient or in combination with a tertiary treatment for reuse. And thirdly, very importantly, if the plant needs to be expanded. So what type of membranes do we have? What type of filtration possibilities do we have? Well, I tried to make a little bit of an illustration here and you have four uh, rectangular bars. The first bar is representing microfilters. And microfilters remove colloidal material, very, very, very fine particles that doesn't settle by gravity. They stay in the solution, so you can't use uh, sedimentation to remove them. Uh, these can be removed by microfilters. And talking about membranes for water treatment, microfilters are rather coarse. Now, going to the next step, ultrafilters. Uh, here you can remove macromolecules. An ultrafilter is actually used for sewage treatment and the membrane bioreactors or the MBRs. With ultrafilter in the sewage treatment and MBR, you can reuse, reduce very, very small things such as viruses, bacteria, and so forth. And ultrafilter, and also very importantly, is now they used as a pre-treatment step for the next two types of uh, membranes, which are the first one, nanofilters. And with nanofilters, we're going really down in very, very, very small quote-unquote openings in the membranes. With a nanofilter you can actually remove two valent ion, ions and molecules such as calcium which is 2 plus you have magnesium. So with nanofilters you can actually also soften water. And nanofilters you can find for groundwater treatment and you can find them also for for freshwater treatment especially when it comes to removing color from lakes. Last we come to reverse osmosis. With reverse osmosis you can remove chloride and sodium salt. That in the water business uh, for drinking water or sewage treatment the, the three major ones are of course ultrafilter, nanofilters and reverse osmosis membranes. And finally what always passes through the membrane? The water of course. That is what we want to clean. So never forget that. Now let's look at drinking water. First I need to show you the membrane, the black line showing the membrane which separates the, what we want to remove and what we want to have in the drinking water. 
Normally, you have a feed of 100% pumped into the membrane. Then, you also need to remove the concentrate. In the concentrate, you will have the things you don't want to have in your drinking water, basically. And how much concentrate you are forced to remove depends on the water. If you have a desalination plant, it could be as much as 50% concentrate. If you have a fresh water or a lake water, you might be, get away with 15% concentrate. And then we come to the permeate, which is the stream which will produce your drinking water. And the same thing there, the more concentrate, the less permeate you have. And again, it all comes down to what type of water you want to, uh, to run in the membrane. Now also, one important parameter is the surface load or flux. Also, <clears throat> the driving pressure. With reverse osmosis, where you have to really stand up to very high salinities, you can be forced to apply up to maybe 80 bar pressure. Normally, I would say for fresh water, you probably can go below 10 bars. Also, importantly, the pretreatment and post-treatment. When you look at desalination, and for instance, the plant I showed in the beginning, in Bakrein, you need to have a very good pretreatment in order to protect the membranes in the reverse osmosis step. Now, with reverse osmosis, you get a water that is basically distilled. You have no minerals in it. So you also need to have a post-treatment to add minerals before you pump out the water to the, to, the, to the net. And you need, of course, minerals for, for the quality of the water to drink it, but also, very importantly, for the distribution network. Now, looking at the conventional activated sludge process, which is basically the biological treatment unit and the sedimentation after. Using membranes in wastewater, what you do is you basically place a ultrafiltration membranes within the activated sludge process. So having the membrane in the activated sludge process, you actually get the water that can be used for tertiary treatment. And how does that compare to a conventional activated sludge process? What do you need to add to the, to the activated sludge process in order to have the same water quality as using a membrane bioreactor or an MBR? Well, you need a sand filter, you need a UV or some sort of disinfection uh, in order to remove or kill off the bacteria and, and viruses. Now, last thing when we talk about pressures, when we have an ultrafiltration membrane in the biological step, you empty it by gravity. But you can also use pumps if you have too low of a difference in height between the outlet and the membrane, then you can of course also use pumps. But compared to drinking water, we're talking meters of very, very low pressure, so to speak. So, membranes are forever. Let's have a look at different types of membranes. Here you see a picture of tube membranes, you see spiral bonds, and you see spaghetti membranes. Different types, different applications. Spiral ones you can find in drinking water, the spaghetti ones, wastewater as a pretreatment step for, for drinking water. Here we have a picture from a plant where you see the UF, the ultrafiltration step, which is a pretreatment step to the reverse osmosis step, which you see here. Here you have a module for flat sheet membranes used for sewage water treatment and MBR. Here you can see a cutout of how a flat sheet membrane is built. The white part is the ultrafiltration membrane, and then you have the rest of the builder on. And here you have the outtake of permeate. Here you can see the NOx and NOx, and also how the MBR, the modules, MBR modules are placed in the tank. Here is a, an example of a membrane unit, MBR unit, that uses these spaghetti 